We appreciate the Predators and Bridgestone Arena for hosting us today. Following this joint meeting, we will take a brief break and then the Sports Authority, we will convene for our regular monthly meeting. Although no action will be taken at today's meeting, I will point out the appeals process for any action of this board can be found at the top of the agenda. This morning, we're gonna receive a presentation from MLS2 Nashville, the committee, which as we all have heard, has been very busy. Uh, they're working to secure an expansion team for Major League Soccer for Nashville. We're very excited to hear more about this process and about the plans for the stadium at the fairgrounds. We want to welcome the fair board. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I believe uh, Chairman Horton will be with us in just a few moments. Um, at this time, I would like to go ahead and, and kick it over to Mary Cavara with the uh, MLS committee to um, make a presentation and get us started today. much Kim we have several presenters today and we do expect uh, Rich Riebling to join us but we'll go ahead and get started and Will Alexander will lead us off thank you thank you very much uh, Mary and thank you very much Kim and thanks uh, to uh, both the, the Fair Board and Sports Authority for inviting us to be here today this is an exciting time for Nashville there's been a lot of, uh, of work done so far in the MLS bid and some, some work to do ahead, but uh, this is a, uh, it's a great opportunity to present this, and we look forward to uh, sharing, what's, uh, sharing what's happening on the MLS front and uh, taking some questions after the presentation. I'd like to okay. begin, here's, a, uh, here's an overview of the, uh, the fairgrounds and the fields and some of the, some of the new development that will, uh, that will take place. And, Rich will, uh, will address some of this when uh, we're able to see him. And what I'll do is get ahead and dive into talking about the, uh, the bid itself and, uh, and the MLS opportunity. And Will, yes. um, can you just take a step back just a moment? Um, the committee pr uh, presented to the full council, that was uh, Monday evening. Correct. <coughs> and, um, and so essentially my understanding, I think it's generally the same presentation, but wasn't I know everyone has busy schedules. I'm not sure that um, the board, the boards were familiar that um, you all were present and did um, talk with the council. Oh yes, yeah, we did. We did on uh, on Monday <coughs> evening, and this is the identical uh, the identical presentation. And uh, we welcome welcome the chance to uh, to make the presentation again for those of you that didn't get to see uh, didn't get to see it on Monday. The uh, the MLS National Committee is the group that I represent, and. Uh, it's composed of about 160 business, civic, and sports leaders from around uh, the Nashville area, and all have the common goal of uh, bringing a major league soccer team to Nashville. Lily Aldrich and, and uh, Eddie George are the honorary co-chairs, but most of the members of the group are, uh, are not household names. And it's, uh, it's important that uh, they were recognized that the, the MLS bid by our city began as a community effort and a big reason why we wear, why we've made so much progress and we're in the strong position where we are today is due to the prominent role that the community has played in this, uh, in this bid so far. Let's talk some about, uh, about the sport of soccer. Now, soccer is the most popular game in the world by a, by a big margin. Uh, over three billion people watch the 2014 World Cup, a full uh, one-fifth of uh, people that live around the world are soccer players. But soccer is not just popular abroad. Soccer is a very popular sport in the United States. 113 million people in, in, living in the U.S. call themselves pro soccer fans, and more people watch the U.S. Uh, the U.S. team play in in the uh, last men's and women's World Cups than tuned in for the World Series and the NBA Finals. Soccer also has a lot of room to grow because its fan base is very young. As you can see, soccer is the number two sport in the U.S. for 12 to 24-year-olds, and soccer is hugely popular among some of the uh, fastest-growing demographic groups in our country. Now, the next question, is Nashville ready for uh, Major League Soccer? Is, is, is soccer popular in Nashville? Absolutely. The big headline number here are the two games that we had this summer that, broke, uh, that both broke state records for attendance for soccer. Over 100,000 people attended games at Nissan Stadium, both the, uh, the U.S.-Panama game in uh, the beginning of July and then at the end of the month, 
the, a game between two English Premier League teams. There are 40,000 approximately youth soccer players in, uh, in the Nashville area, and the number of high school soccer players have been growing at a steady clip too. So the MLS is very aware of the interest in soccer in our community. If you can see, Nashville is also uh, named as a candidate city for the post the 2026 World Cup. Nashville is seen as a soccer hotbed around the country, and that's a big reason why they're, uh, they're interested in, in, a, uh, in a team potentially in this market. Now, Major League, uh, Major League Soccer. Major League Soccer was founded in 1996, and it's now an established and, uh, and fast-growing league. The regular season runs from March to October. Attendance at MLS matches is the third highest of any U.S. pro sport behind only the NFL and uh, Major League Baseball at about 22,000 fans a game. MLS fans also are young, like soccer fans in general. You've got a full half of them are in the 18 to 34 bracket, meaning there's a lot of room to grow, and MLS games are broadcast nationally. The, the MLS has never been in a stronger position than it, uh, than it is today. Just a couple weeks ago, they signed a new uh, $700 million apparel deal with Adidas, which is almost five times the, uh, the, the previous contract. You have uh, 25 owners. MLS owners collectively own 25 teams that are in U.S. pro leagues and other pro leagues around the world. There's a lot of interest in the league. The, uh, the best watched MLS All-Star game was this summer, and uh, the most viewed MLS Cup, which is the championship, was uh, December. So this is a, uh, a hot time for the league, and the league is, uh, is really performing at a high level. Here's the current Major League Soccer football. You can see the void in the Mid-South, and this is something that, uh, that interests the league and, and is a great case that Nashville can make. If uh, an MLS team were awarded to our city, we would be the closest MLS, MLS club for almost 13 million people living in parts of nine states. Another interesting thing about this map is that Atlanta is the, uh, is the, is the best performing MLS team right now, attendance-wise. It's just their first season, they're averaging 46,000 people per game, and uh, it shows that the soccer can be very popular in the South, and uh, that's, a great, uh, that's a great thing that the MLS has taken, uh, taken note of also. So here's the current status of the MLS expansion plans. There are 24 teams. The league is planning to go to 28. 12 cities have applied for uh, the four expansion spots. Two teams will be awarded this December. Two teams will be awarded sometime in 2018. The new, the new teams that are awarded during this expansion round will begin play in 2020 to 2022. Most importantly, this is what the MLS says is their final expansion round. The league is, uh, is prepared to stop at 28 teams, and uh, that means that the window for Nashville to act to get an MLS team is now. The league has been very clear about their expansion criteria. Uh, they look for a committed local ownership group. They look for a stadium plan where the league is comfortable with the design and the location of the proposed stadium. And they look at the uh, they look at the market, which is fan sponsors, and what does the market bring to the league to help grow the sport of soccer in the MLS uh, around the country and around the world. Here's our city's competition. There are 12, uh, 12 cities we're competing against. We feel uh, very good about where we stand, but you can see there's some large cities, there's some great sports towns that are uh, that are competing for teams. There's a lot of interest in getting into the uh, getting into Major League Soccer. Here's Nashville's strengths. This is why we feel confident about, uh, about our bid right now. Engaged community. It took Commissioner Don Garber about an hour or two of being in Nashville to know what a can-do city Nashville is and how well we work together and how we aim to do big things by cooperating. And uh, the involvement by the community, the ability of our, of our community to get behind an important cause like this is a, is a big plus for us. Our attractive demographics were one of the uh, fastest growing cities in the country, we're a very diverse city, both of those are, uh, are advantages. We all know about the, about the great job growth and the low unemployment rate in Nashville, we've got a, we've got a strong economy. We've talked about the exceptional attendance at the uh, soccer games here. Really, Nashville now has a national reputation for having fantastic soccer fans and a real appetite for the, uh, for the game. The MLS also is going to look at, well, what do you do for your teams currently here? And we think about the Predators, which were the story of the NHL last season. Woo! We think about the, uh, <laughs> we think about the, uh, the Titans, which sold out over 100 consecutive games when they moved into Nissan Stadium. And the sounds last time I looked were leading their, uh, leading their division in attendance. So we are, a, uh, we are a great sports town, and the world, uh, the world knows it. 
One thing that Nashville has that's uh, unique, and it's a big plus, mm -hmm. is we're an entertainment capital. We've got a globally recognized brand. The MLS can gain a lot by being affiliated with a city like Nashville that's known all over the world as the MLS grows its profile. And finally, we've got great potential corporate sponsors. For a city of our size, Nashville has a disproportionate number of big headquarters. The business community is excited about the MLS push, and, uh, and that's something that's, uh, that's working in our favor. So as you can see here, these are a lot of quotes by Commissioner Don Garber. Uh, the commissioner was able to visit Nashville, spent the night here, visited, was here a full day on July 7th, and then attended the U.S. Panama game on, uh, on July 8th. He was very impressed both with the market potential for Nashville and the ability for Nashville to do what it takes to, uh, to be awarded an MLS team. He also noted, though, that what's, what's remaining to be done is to present a, a stadium plan to the MLS, and that's an important part of their, uh, of their criteria. But uh, with this, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, you know, note that the, uh, the stage is set. A lot of the pieces are in place. Nashville is a great fit for the MLS, and the MLS is very, uh, is very interested in Nashville. So this is an exciting opportunity for our city. And uh, I'd like to introduce John Ingram now. John is going to be the lead investor in Nashville's new MLS team if we are awarded a franchise. There's not a better person in the world to, uh, to do this than, uh, than John. John is passionate about uh, soccer, and more importantly, he's passionate about Nashville. And uh, he and his team have been working very hard, driving this bit since January, We've gotten our city in a, uh, a fantastic place. And now I'll turn it over to uh, John, but thank you very much. Thank you, Will, um, Madam Chair, uh, the rest of the Sports Authority and the Fair Board. I am really excited to be here. Um, and I'm, I'm excited because I get to talk about something that I like, which is uh, potential win-win partnerships. And, and win, win for, for our city. And, and I say our city because um, um, th this, is, uh, this is my home, too. And it's been my family's home since, um, since the late 30s. My, my grandparents had the the good fortune to, through serendipity, make an investment in the, the textile company in the, in the mid-30s. And so my grandparents, um, who lived in St. Paul, came down to visit. And I think one particularly cold stretch in, uh, in St. Paul in the, in the late 30s, my grandfather turned to my grandmother and said, this is ridiculous. I said, this is only fit for a polar bear, and I'm not one. So we're moving to Nashville. And, and Nashville has been home for us um, since then. And and, and I'm, I'm so excited to, to, to really to have, and I guess this goes, which is forward, Will, to the right, oops, um, to, 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 to have the opportunity to say, what do I, what do I see? Um, and, and, and I see the opportunity really for, to, to, to work with the city to do the next big thing for the city. And, and that's to bring the global sport of soccer to a globally branded city, which is, which is our home of Nashville. Um, and I know from, uh, from the um, uh, Major League Soccer's perspective that, that ownership matters. Um, and you know, it, it matters to them that uh, not only that, that the ownership has got financial means, um, that's certainly important because uh, the expansion fee is, is quite significant and their startup expenses and ongoing expenses to fund te you know, team training facilities, all these things that will be in, in our future that will be the ownership's responsibility. But it's also important to them and something they care a lot about is, is the ownership's connectivity to the city. Um, and, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to say, I mean, I'd like to believe that that's an area where, where um, we get maybe a little extra gold star uh, because, because um, um, my, my family and I care, care deeply about Nashville, been here since the 30s, and, and you know, I'm certainly planning on being here uh, the rest of my life. And, and I, Will has said, I, I think this is just a great opportunity for Nashville as well. Um, you know, Will mentioned uh, the, the, the great enthusiasm for, for get the games that, that, that we um, <coughs> helped to host in, in July, the amount of youth soccer that is being, that is played here, and that's only growing. Uh, I would say you can make strong uh, arguments for uh, around the economic development that's likely to happen uh, around the WeHo area um, if, if, if this 
stadium uh, trans transpires, much much as has happened over in Germantown with the first Tennessee Park, and and we were discussing earlier um, um, in East Nashville with uh, with Nissan Stadium, um, and I also believe that this would be a, another great boost for for tourism, um, for both domestic and, and and international tourism, and and with all the hotels uh, rooms that we're building, I, this would be a good way to help make sure they stay they stay full. Um, but I would also say that um, I think uh, there are probably 30 or 40 different languages that are spoken uh, around, uh, around the city of Nashville in different areas, and, and uh, they, they would be different languages. Uh, but there's one common language um, that's spoken in all those, in all those places, and, and that common language is the language of soccer. Because every, every one of those groups, their, their home countries, play soccer. And, it, and it's a point of national pride um, for, for them. So ultimately, um, I really look forward to and, and am very hopeful about um, our chances. I'd like to do this in Nashville. I'd like to do it for Nashville. And I'd like to do it with Nashville. And, and I think we're, um, we've got a, a really unique period of time right now to, to make that all happen. With respect to the, the, the stadium itself, um, I, I told the Metro Council uh, the other night that I always envision um, the, the, the stadium as a, as a dual-use facility, that it could host both um, MLS soccer as well as NCAA football. Um, and, and while they're only in, in an exploratory stage, um, I know it's something that Vanderbilt is, is considering. And at this moment, I might ask uh, Vice Chancellor and Athletic Director David Williams to come up and, and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you all for having me. Um, as you all know, Vanderbilt has been here almost 150 years. 150 years from now, Vanderbilt will still be a part of this community. We pride ourselves on being a, a, a strong supporter of making this city the city that it is. And so anytime there are opportunities that we think that the city can become even a greater city, we're always interested in it. And I would say to you, Vanderbilt is very, very supportive of bringing an MLS soccer team here. We think it will add greater excitement to the city. So Vanderbilt is supportive of this idea. We also, as I said, look at all different opportunities that involve, that could involve Vanderbilt. And as the city and the ownership group explore uh, a plan for a new stadium, we'll be watching that and have been watching that very closely. Uh, as that vision progresses and develops, we'll be very interested in working with the ownership group to see if, in fact, there is the possibility and potential for Vanderbilt to play football and soccer in that stadium. At this point in time, as John said, this is just exploratory, and we will continue to assess that opportunity. And if at the end of the day, we determine that this benefits this community, our fans, and our university, we'd be happy and open to discuss and further uh, accommodations and further situations and partnerships. I want to thank you for having us, and uh, I'll turn it back over to John. Thank you very much, David. And, and um, she she got up and kicked this off. Ma uh, Mary Cavara um, is is going to be speaking next uh, uh, with some more details about about the stadium. But I I just did want to take a moment. Not only is she the CFO for Ingram Industries, which is a full time job, but it, I don't know how she has done it. But she's also kind of been the project lead um, uh, on on this on our whole MLS uh, efforts here. And, and I can 100% assure you that without Mary's efforts and the efforts of, of, of the team we put together, we would not be as far as we are. But we've been very fortunate to have her leading this. And I'll get her to come back up and talk uh, more specifically about the stadium. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That's very kind. Sorry, I guess my technology skills aren't um, <laughs> quite where the other ones are. But as we heard from Will and John, we've checked the box on two of Major League Soccer's requirements, ownership and market. And so now our task is to complete the stadium work. 
As Commissioner Garber indicated during your vis his visit last month, we must secure financing for a soccer-specific stadium, and he made it clear that no city would be approved without a soccer plan intact. So the league believes that a soccer-specific stadium is important for several reasons. A stadium designed for soccer will have the correct field dimensions and result in uh, being safer for the players. Professional sports teams, just like our businesses, also need viable revenue streams in order to have long-term success. And just like our hockey fans here at Bridgestone Arena, soccer fans want an authentic experience. And a stadium has benefits beyond just the soccer fans. Nashville could benefit from potentially collegiate and other youth events, as well as other community and entertainment activities. Early on, our uh, ownership group realized that we don't have experience with stadiums, so we went out and hired um, experts. And the experts are Icon Venue Group. They're based in Denver, Colorado. They have extensive experience in this area, and so they serve as an owner's representative. And in fact, they've been involved with 11 of the MLS stadiums and are currently working with four of the expansion bid seats. We've been diligently working on a stadium plan for the past several months, and on Monday we unveiled the vision for the stadium, and again we'll share um, those renderings with you this, after, or this morning. So as a CFO, I know my next question would be, what's it gonna cost? And to kind of put that in perspective and let you know where we are in that process, several MLS teams have recently constructed soccer-specific stadiums with costs ranging from about 160 million to over 350 million in Los Angeles. The 160 was uh, Orlando City. In addition, several of the expansion bid cities have announced cost estimates from the low 200s to about mid 200 million. Soccer, or excuse me, stadium costs are gonna be unique to each facility. They're gonna be impacted by many variables, including design, location, size, among other factors. We've spent a lot of time working on the estimated stadium cost, and we continue to work on this part of the plan. We expect to have the details soon. We'll also continue to work with the mayor and her team on what the details of a private-public partnership uh, may look like, and we'll come back to you within about 30 to 45 days. As you may recall, back in January, the mayor identified the National Fairgrounds as a site for a Major League Soccer stadium. The preliminary site plan for the stadium will show that it's located in the elevated portion of the fairgrounds west of the speedway. The plans also incorporate the fairgrounds current programming. On Monday evening, Ron Sally, who's a senior vice president with Icon Venue Group, uh, presented the stadium features. He's unable to join us today. As I walk through some of the stadium features, Afterwards, if you have questions, please let us know and we'll work with ICON to make sure your questions are answered because in no way am I pretending that I have the knowledge that Ron does. So we'll start with a look at uh, the site plan. So as you look at the site plan, there's a couple of features I wanna point out. First of all, as new stadiums have develop, been developed in today's age, ride sharing's become very important. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like in the future, but you can see there's two hubs that have been identified as potential ride-sharing locations. Also, um, in one of my other jobs, I serve on Moving Forward's uh, Revenue and uh, Finance Task Force's chairperson, and we released the report yesterday, so talking about transit, and on Nolansville, there's a potential future transit hub, which is adjacent to the stadium site. As you turn towards soccer-specific items in the green, you could see one of the traditions is marching into the stadium, and this is where the uh, supporters could march. And the other buildings shown in the white indicate kind of the current fairground programming, just intended to represent the square footage of what's required to continue that. We have not made any attempt to identify what the specific uh, buildings would like or anything. Another item that was very important to our team as we went through the design process was the importance of an authentic Nashville venue that's integrated with the surrounding area. We did not want this to look like a spaceship had just been dropped into the neighborhood. That's, that's not who we're about. And so the plans, early plans, would be using brick and other authentic <coughs> materials to kind of show the historical architecture of the city. And that's what these two uh, elevate, 
elevations illustrate. The next view is the aerial view where you're southeast looking toward downtown that shows the proximity to, to downtown and what a potential view could look like in the evening. The plaza entry view is created so that as you would walk into the stadium, you have a direct view of the field as well as uh, onto the lower bowl. The plaza could also be a gathering place for fans as they come into the stadium and, and others. Um, and the space could also be used to accommodate other public and civic gatherings. But a nice uh, wide open area is planned here. This next slide illustrates what a soccer configuration would look like with the scoreboard at the west end of the stadium. The design contemplates prime soccer sight lines based on the pitch or the level of the seating so that virtually every seat in the house has a very good view of what's happening on the field. We also believe that the stadium could become a destination stadium and be able to host other larger events and other matches, such as uh, some of the ones that we recently hosted at uh, Nissan and other places. From a technology standpoint, we've not only considered what MLS needs for broadcasting or potentially uh, NCAA, but a very robust Wi-Fi environment so that you could enhance every fan's experience. And then next, I'm gonna point out a couple of the soccer-specific features of the stadium. So first of all, let me say, this is not Nashville. This is the Orlando City Stadium, and this is the standing fan area. And what this means is this is usually where the most passionate soccer fans gather. And we actually had a chance to observe them earlier this year. They cheer, they chant, they beat drums, other light smoke devices, and they're just, they provide the soccer environment. And so these are standing areas with cup holders attached to the rails, and they did actually stand the entire game. And so we just think this could be a, a, an interesting uh, feature for our soccer fans. Another unique stadium feature includes the corner kick terraces. And so this provides a direct view to one of the important soccer features, the corner kick. The area also contemplates food and beverage service. And I liken it to the sounds experience at First Tennessee Park in the right field seating area where there's seats and tables and food sivers there so fans can enjoy the game as well as the food and beverage uh, at the facility. So before I turn it over to Rich, I just wanted to also let you know that we will be getting together with the neighbors in this area as well as other interested groups to share more information and obtain feedback as we continue to work through this process. And so you'll be hearing more about that. And I'll turn it over to Rich. Good morning. It seems like it's been forever since I've been here getting withdrawals. First, let me apologize for, for running late. I, I think the original plan was for me to sort of kick it off. And uh, when I was 15, 20 minutes late, I think it was good of you to go ahead and get started without me. And so I, I apologize. I, I usually, uh, I'm a little more prompt than that, but uh, uh, I had a uh, higher authority sort of detain me, so if, you, if, you, if that's okay. Um, secondly, I, I want to thank you for, uh, for hosting this joint meeting. I think sort of unprecedented kind of as I looked around uh, in Metro government, I think to have two committees, two, two groups of already sort of work together on a project like this and actually kind of have a public meeting in which they uh, sort of hear this presentation at the same time. So thank you, Chairman Horton and Atkins, for sort of arranging the schedules and sort of making this happen because I think it is, this is an important issue for the city and it does involve, um, you know, more than just the sports authority and more, more than just the fair, fair board, but both if it's going to work. Uh, and it's, I think it's good that everyone gets to hear it at the same time and, and hopefully uh, you all get to know each other a little bit and I'm not, you know, if you haven't before, had a chance to meet each other and go on. And Rip, I do not think that was your picture in the rowdy section of the side. <laughs> they told me it was you and I said I don't think it was you up there. So I, I, I know you wouldn't be up there being rowdy at a, at a, at a sporting event or anything like that. I may have been. So, may have been. <laughs> ah, maybe I was wrong. Maybe it was right. Um, so let me let me close on this with, with just a few comments and then obviously uh, any questions that you have that I can help answer with what and I think as you've as you've heard we, we don't have all the answers today by me by any means uh, but we thought it was important 
uh, to get uh, this discussion started in a, in a positive way uh, and, 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 and sort of everyone kind of get a sense of the concept of what we're trying to do uh, sort of before we get into the devil of the details. Uh, I think it's just a, a courtesy, if nothing else, to let you all kind of know where we're headed on this and, and to be sort of ahead of the game. So um, I think the work that's been done thus far has been um, sort of monumental in scope in such a short period of time. Uh, you know, I, I think when we first started talking about, uh, I think when Will Alexander and Ambassador Haggerty first came to see, see me about their interest in soccer, you know, it was sort of a thanks, nice guys, you know, kind of pat them on the head and say, thank you, we appreciate it, it's a great idea. And suddenly, uh, as we wake up, I think we're uh, in less than a year, uh, we actually are on the precipice of, of potentially being able to actually secure an MLS franchise for the city. And their work has been uh, extraordinary, and of course, getting uh, getting uh, John Ingram into it uh, uh, brings a great flavor, we think, to it because it is local. It's a local, uh, a local group, uh, local local lead sponsorship to make it happen. So, uh, kind of what's happened has been uh, at a at a fast pace, and we're going to have to continue on a fast pace uh, if we're going to be able to to secure this franchise and 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 see if we can get a stadium plan approved prior to. Um, the, the board, the MLS board meeting in, in, in December. Uh, you know, the mayor has, has, has said uh, uh, unequivocally that she would love to see this happen, uh, but it's got to be, you know, the details. It's got to be good for this, it's got to work for the city and work for everyone. Uh, and we really do believe that the fairgrounds uh, is, the right, is the right location for this for uh, uh, lots of reasons, um, some of which include uh, maybe primarily be including being a major catalyst uh, for what we see is a major renovation of that of that property. Uh, we have started that process uh, slowly because we're doing a lot of work. You see, you see the field, the drawing for the soccer fields and the play fields on the fairground property, which we think is sort of transformative in that it, you know, takes up you know concrete space and puts in green space that can be used year-round by a lot of a lot of the citizens as well as being designed so that parking can go there. So there's been steps already made to redo the fairgrounds, but we think that putting a soccer facility there um, would really, um, really be a kickstarter to make that happen at a much more rapid pace. Um, I should say that any soccer plan for a stadium will also include um, a recommendation of funding for significant improvements to the rest of the fairgrounds property. Uh, I don't think you can drop a stadium, a new stadium, into that complex and not do some some very important work uh, at the rest of the, uh, the rest of the facility. Uh, obviously, the buildings there are old and antiquated, uh, and uh, getting some new buildings will only help the fairgrounds and be uh, the fair board be. Uh, you know, great stewards going forward. So anything we do will also include uh, a, a re major renovations of the fairground property. So we see this as not an either or, but a plus plus, and that potentially we have a soccer facility and we also have uh, uh, this important uh, asset uh, really sort of brought to its potential, which we haven't seen, I think, in, in many, many years. Let's just, we'll say it that. Um, so, um, over the next coming weeks, kind of the next scenario is, um, you know, we've got to figure out cost and how we're going to pay for it. Obviously, pretty important, pretty fundamental to anything we do. Uh, and, and we're going to be working on that diligently over the next several weeks. Um, as, as, as we told the council, uh, and some of you I think were there on Monday night, um, you know, it's critical that, um, you know, there are a lot of needs in the city. And, and you heard some of the councilmen speak up about some of those needs and, and their interest in, you know, in, in not seeing and while being supportive of this concept, we also need to make sure that it's fiscally responsible and minimizes the impact to the city going forward. Uh, we, we share that, no, no surprise there. Uh, and, and what we hope to come back with, with is something that we think we can get a lot of support for uh, and that will not, um, you know, not really significantly impact the city's general fund, which we need to operate, you know, the general government. Um, timing is uh, over the next, you know, 30 to 45 days. Uh, you know, this is sort of the top priority right now to see if we can make this happen because of this, this deadline that we see out there in early December. Uh, we're going to continue to work with that. And as you have meetings or we have the need for meetings, we will get back with you with more information uh, as we develop it. 
Um, you know, I think this is a, a great opportunity for the city. Uh, I, I think we all saw, um, um, I guess I'm going to have to hear a, a shout out again in the, in the back in a second of what I'm getting ready to say. So I'm giving him a little, a little alertness to that. But I think what we all saw, the importance of sports in the community, we saw the city really coming together in the, in the spring with our experience with the, uh, with the uh, NHL playoffs. But I'd like sure I'd hear another shout. Thank you. I, I, I programmed that so well, and I was so shocked that I didn't get it. Uh, but, and, and I think, and, and equally so with our with our friends across the river, the Titans. I think we're all very op, very uh, cautiously optimistic uh, about uh, you know a great season to come from them and some of the experiences that we've had in the past for that. So we see soccer fitting into this. In this environment, this community, very well, uh, but it's got to be a, it's got to be a transaction that makes sense for the city, and and obviously it's going to have to make sense for for the ownership group. That's what we're working on, uh, and uh, we will we will have more details and continue to work with you in the days and months ahead. So, again, thank you for this uh, for this opportunity, and and look forward to uh, to seeing a lot more of you over the next uh, 60 or 90 days. Any questions for any of us? We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. We appreciate. It remarks and I'm sure um, there might be a few questions out there so at this time it looks like Alicia's handing out um, I know my eyes uh, couldn't see some of the material so that will be helpful and at this time Margaret do you want to start us off sure yep okay um, so how many games are playing in the state home games I believe they will be in the neighborhood of 17 okay. so, uh, home uh, MLS soccer games. So that brings me, of course, to the next question about dual purposes and other things that will be done in the stadium. And I, I'm interested myself in seeing the National Women's Soccer League and team. And, um, also and I'm familiar with at least, I think, four teams that play in MLS stadiums. And recently, I think with the Orlando City opening. They opened with the MLS team and Orlando Pride, right? And which is the which women's, is the women's team. team. Yes. And so, do you know how that came about? How they were able to get the MLS team, get the stadium, and have the women's team also part of that opening? Stadium? I know that it. I know that it exists because um, because we visited Orlando. Right. I'm not familiar with exactly how they. How they pulled it all well, of course, I have no idea either. And, and where I'm going on this is that I know there's been so much, so quickly, efforts to get these three prongs together with the stadium being now the most important piece to get the MLS team together. And it's taken such a young person's effort <laughs> to get this done. But I just ask you to also <coughs> consider when you bring something back to us something that will give us some kind of insight as to the owner's vision of what, if anything, could be do, done to also include a women's team. Because as I read about this, I understand, you know, the, because if the stadium's there, the cost of bringing or having a women's team is much less, obviously, because there's already the infrastructure there. And with so many women who play and and spend their money and are interested and watch soccer and how important it is in our community. It would be great to have a stadium that actually, you know, and we have arenas and stadiums and others that we have men's team playing. It would be great to have uh, in Nashville uh, something that our city supports where women play professionally too. I think it's an excellent, excellent point. And, um, I think the point you made earlier of we've had so much to do to, to oh, try to pull together the basics that that hasn't been one of the things that we've had a, a, a chance to focus on much in the same way is we haven't had a chance to focus on training facilities right which is which is another piece that will that we'll have to to, to deal with um, but I think it's it's perfectly fair to 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 um, and, and I, I think a great question is to have a vision for it um, I have a, a business colleague who um, uh, promises me if his stock hits a certain level that he's going to be the owner of the women's team. I mean, and that I, sounds really good. Um, and and, and, and uh, I, I haven't forgotten that either, by the way. Um, uh, so, but uh, you're, I mean, it, it's certainly my my intent that we would have we would have both. 
but as we spoke earlier, well, I mean, really the, great. When, the women's women's soccer in this country is is far ahead of, of, of men, and and has been better attended and more successful. So I mean, I think it's a 100% fair point. I it's really we want. appreciate what you say. I, I would just like when you bring it before us again, if you would address that in a little bit more detail as to how you see when you come before the Sports Authority, if you do, because I know that all of this is still unknown where everything's going to happen. What you see is for that as a probability. So noted. Thank right. you. Thank you. Jason. A couple follow-up questions. Um, um, Margaret talked about like my colleagues are happy. You, you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're gonna stay with you. Uh, alter Margaret talked a little bit about alternative uses, and, and, and I was wondering, what are you projecting beyond MLS and the, the 17 or so home games a year, sort of uh, international friendlies, uh, other sporting events? Uh, I think concerts were discussed on Monday night at the council meeting. What sort of additional volume of event nights are you all projecting uh, that the stadium would be? would be doing on an annual basis, and yeah. possibly Vanderbilt, of course. Um, I mean, uh, there's obviously MLS, possibly Vanderbilt, um, and I would say that, that in, in part of our, um, some of our preliminary thoughts, and, and, and we've kind of made provisions for it in, in, the, um, in, in kind of our early um, stadium work, it, it would be um, to, to have a, a medium-sized um, outdoor concert venue. Um, obviously, Ascend is a lovely venue downtown, but I think it caps out at about 8,000. Um, and then, you know, you, then, you know, there's nothing between the, you know, that kind of 8 and 20,000. And, and I think there could be a particularly great, um, th this stadium could be a particularly great venue um, for outdoor, outdoor concerts uh, there. Beyond that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard for us to have projected beyond that because I mean, there, are, there are issues like uh, natural grass versus um, you know, turf um, that would that would play into those kind of those kind of decisions, and those are those are issues that, that we'll have to wrestle with, um, you know, variables that we'll have to have to solve for. But um, we, we'd like it to be active, uh, to be a you know a very active um, uh, facility. So, so we'll be working on that. And um, just one other, and I'll, I'll hand it off to the very large number of people up here. Um, regarding Vanderbilt, um, when can we expect uh, a more definitive answer? And that may get, get you off the hook and get Mr. Williams back up here. But when can we expect an answer on whether Vanderbilt is in on this or not? I know on Monday night it was discussed uh, that the size of the stadium could increase then to 33 to 35,000. Um, so obviously there's a different scale there, and there's a, obviously a big, really different scale in the uh, type of event between a 35,000 football game and a 22,000 or so soccer game. So when will we know if Vanderbilt is in on this uh, uh, adventure or if they're, uh, if, they're, if they're not going to be in on that? Well, I, I, I can't speak for Vanderbilt's process, uh, but what I would say is that I mean, for us to come back with a, with a more defined um, situation we'll have to have all those questions answered so you know, to come to come back to, to talk to you more definitively we'll hopefully you know have all those answers thanks i was curious about the uh, kind of average price points of the mls games I, I looked at atlanta i think they were like around 40 to 250 i didn't know if that was representative of broader league or kind of what you're looking at I think that's about accurate. The average price point in the league is about $30 yeah. for a ticket. Obviously, some of the premium seating would be higher. Yes. You mentioned that the average cost for a stadium runs from 160 to 350, and I was just like to hear a little bit more about what creates that variety. I understand that Los Angeles would be a little more expensive, but what drives that, and kind of where do you see this stadium falling? Okay. So what I had uh, been able to comment on was that uh, the Orlando City Stadium, which was just completed this past spring, and again the one of the challenges is making sure we have apples and apples as we look at it. Um, it was about 160 million. It seats around 25,000 fans. I know they added some seats uh, during the construction. And then the Los Angeles Stadium, the costs are north of 350 million.
part of that, from what I, and that's scheduled to open in the spring of 2018. So again, it goes back to stadium design, kind of philosophy, the location, and there's a lot of variables. And so one of the things that we can come back to you with is just some of these case studies on these other stadiums that we have out there. And we are working on the details. I can tell you that um, the Los Angeles version is not the direction we're headed. <laughs> and we want to be very good stewards of everybody's funds. And so we want to make sure that it's a effective, multifunctional stadium if that's the direction it ends up going, but one that also provides a really good fan experience. In reference to bringing women into the, the mix, I would like to see if you can also uh, canvas the uh, presidents of the universities uh, for those who may have already started a hockey program for women or intend to and what will be some of the things that they would have to do in order to get it done. So I know that at, at uh, Tennessee State, one of the things they did was to drop the swimming men's program that I used to coach uh, because we had to have 14 men and they had me push me into a coaching golf, which was five, that was all needed. But they would sometimes have to look at those things and examine it whether or not they can participate. But I would like for someone to really take the effort to try and see what can be done and if they are interested and if they have programs. All right, th thank you. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll talk to the other universities. Uh, I just got two or three questions. Uh, what's the season in soccer? What? It, it usually starts, I think, in March um, and, and goes through October. Um, and but, but there are, you know, there are, there are stops for international type of tournaments and things that 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 are, you know, that kind of interrupt the season, almost like All Star games do in 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 the other sports. But they're they're longer stops for. You know, or, or interruptions. So it's 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 kind of over that period of time, though. Okay. Long and, season. And um, one of my other questions: what what size track of land at the fairgrounds would this take? I think there's uh, is there eighty something acres out there. One hundred seventeen. So how, how much track how much track would this take? I will have to get that for you. Okay, and then I guess uh, uh, my next question would be that uh, has the city uh, determined how much dollar that the city would have to put in this? We have, we, no, we're, we're, that's what we're working on. That, that decision has not been made. We're getting all, we're trying to get the cost. And then we start looking at the various revenue streams that are available and we'll start making that decision. So that'll be what we come back to, to both these two bodies as well as obviously ultimately the council uh, sometime uh, later this fall. As you know, for the sports part, I mean, as we envision it kind of structurally and it's still not in concrete, is that's obviously fair ground property. Fair board owns, you know, the land. They would lease it to the sports authority, ground lease the land for the soccer stadium to the sports authority. Sports authority would issue revenue bonds to pay for the cost of the, st of the stadium's construction. Before the sports authority is, is can issue bonds, the city council has to sign off on it. So that's kind of the basic order of steps that have to happen. Uh, and so it's, uh, you know, obviously the fair board would have to agree to the lease of the property and, and, and all the, and then the necessary steps after that. But no, we, uh, we don't have that quite figured out yet. We, we're working on it, but uh, it's just premature to even get into it now. But we will have that in plenty of time for people to, to chew on and think about before anybody's asked to make a final decision. Well, my thing about it, I go back, uh, back when NFL was coming here and, uh, you know, the, the general taxpayer uh, got quite a bit involved in that, you know, where we even had a referendum yes, on whether to have that yes, here or not. And we did. Whether that would get back into something like that, you know, with the taxpayers. Yeah. No, I, I think clearly, uh, you know, from hearing from the council and, and, and my comments to, to them uh, publicly and privately is that this has got to be a win-win for the city, one that we all feel very comfortable with. Otherwise, it's just not going to, it, we're just not going to be able to get it done. So 
what that means right now, I don't know exactly, but uh, clearly, as, as I've said before, and I, and I noticed that uh, Mary has now picked up on it, it is a private-public partnership. Uh, people always call them public-private <coughs> partnerships, and we sort of reverse that around to make it a private-public partnership, because we really do have to show uh, real skin of the game going forward on this from the private side. All right, thanks, Rich. I don't have the acreage for the footprint, but the square footage is about 500,000 gross square feet. Is there one thing on that? Is that obviously um, we don't, we think there's adequate space to allow the fair board to continue to do all its operations. The racetrack's not going to be impacted by this. The racetrack stays in operation. Uh, so it's not a matter of, uh, of, of it, it'll be restructuring of some of the buildings and facilities, making them hopefully more functional and better and, and more modern and usable. But we envision, you know, not much changing on it, just a re, sort of a reallocation of resources. Well, the reason I ask that is because, you know, there's uh, talk in the papers about the state fair moving out of Nashville yeah, to somewhere that. else, and I know this money put in the mayor's put money in to renovate right. some of the buildings out there. That's which, yes, sir. That's badly needed out there also. Yeah, I mean, the state fair is a whole different issue, which I don't even pretend to understand all the, 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 the intricacies of where that stands, but there's a whole different group at a state level that's looking at alternative locations for that for that fair, and we'll see how that plays out. Yeah. Could you speak to uh, any discussions you've had about parking, what the provisions would be there? Um, would there be structures built on the property? Yeah. I, I think um, there, we have talked about structured parking, but I'm not sure the cost is going to allow us to do that at this time. I mean, it's pretty expensive to do structured parking. Uh, I, I don't have a count, but I think uh, the feeling is that be, be, because of uh, you know the land be available to be adequate parking, uh, you know, no, I mean, no stadium has enough parking. I mean, it's sort of the nature of the beast. But as we see more and more people go to events through ride share, hopefully a transit, as we talked about earlier, the envision, uh, my, other, my other day job is trying to figure out how we're going to do transit. <laughs> uh, and, 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 but we would envision in Knowlesville Road obviously being a major transit corridor at some point in time. Uh, and then uh, with a big center, you know, major transit stop being right there at the fairgrounds property. So I think as patterns change, the demands for parking are somewhat less than they were in the past. But I think between the, the open space now on the, on the fairground prop, fairgrounds property uh, and, and other space, we should have, you know, more than adequate space. You know, adequate will get us through, never, never enough. One quick follow-up on parking. Um, and I think it was said during your comments to council, but the, the, the vision is that the, the fair park, um, which we've already heard about being in, in presentations from um, some of the parks folks being reinforced for parking, but is your vision that fair park will always be used, utilized as um, Parking for for soccer games and events. I, I think I, my understanding. I don't have the. I don't. I would double check this. Is that you could utilize that for parking for events like flea market, and I would think for soccer games as well. I would think it could be used for that. I, I think it's being designed for that purpose. You mentioned that the season was uh, six to seven months long, and we played seventeen home games. Yeah. So is it like a, a thirty-four game season? Yes. Yeah. And they're spread out. I, I was surprised when I when I looked at the schedule for one of the teams when we visited the facility. Mayor and I visited the facility with the mayor in Colorado, and the season does stretch a long time. But there is, is, is there's breaks because you know when you have the uh, international games and the U.S. Olympic team or the U.S. national team plays, then they stop their game, the MLS games, and everybody goes and or though not everybody, but the best players go to play on the on the national team. So there are a lot of uh, it's not you know it's three or four games a month is what it really comes down to. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you uh, and the mayor for your commitment to the fairgrounds revamping it. It's been a uh, really great to see so far. Um, just a little bit of clarity since you're the bond guy. Uh, some statements, I believe, that was put forth on Monday. But um, was it uh, essentially you're talking about maybe two, two general obligation bonds, one for the stadium and one for the buildings and other no, things? I, well, I, no, no. I, well, I, well, I see this. Is there's, there's two separate projects. 
but it has to be done sort of together. I think the stadium is a revenue bond project that would be up through the sports authority because typically we've had all the sports facilities in the city are, are sort of owned and controlled by the sports authority on behalf of the city, for the city. Uh, and that would be for the stadium per se. Uh, but I, as, as I said earlier, and I, and I, and I, and I think I know we, the mayor means this very hard, wholeheartedly, is that we can't clearly um, where they're locating the stadium is going to disrupt a lot of the existing buildings on the fairground property. And, and, and doing an analysis, and I think Laura's looked at this probably more closely than I have, but um, you know, renovating some of those buildings is probably not the greatest idea if you can get a new building for probably uh, you know, not a whole lot more than the renovation would be. So yeah, so the idea be, is the city would invest in the fairgrounds property in conjunction with the development of the stadium. Do you also envision using the maybe a TDZ or TIF as part of this as well? Um, I don't. Well, there's no authority for a TIF in that area. I we, you know, I think there could be some potential development around the stadium, and some of those revenues could help offset some of the costs. But uh, that we hadn't got into those details. Um, I think you mentioned earlier, kind of getting into the devils and the details phase. And I think one thing I, I think would be uh, helpful as we now go into that. And it really got brought to light after uh, I think saw a story this week about how Atlanta. Uh, when they're building their new SunTrust Park, that the you know I think the, Met, the their police were involved, and so now there's like a million dollar shortfall for their uh, their police uh, traffic patrols year. But but basically getting the coordination, I think sure. uh, it would it'd be, be prudent for, for Laura and Monica that, yeah. that where where appropriate to be involved in those you know discussions is they're going to be the ones kind of stuck with yeah. dealing with this after we're we're gone. Yeah. Well, one thing to remember is while we, we do need to move fairly quickly in terms of getting approval of, of a stadium plan in order to meet the MLS schedule, we're not under a immediate deadline to start this construction because it's my, as I understand it, we're looking at 21, right? 2020. So we're, we're not looking at 2021 before the before the, the league would the team would start playing in the yeah. stadium. So we have time to really get yeah. into all the details of the project as we go forward. Yeah. I guess one of my concerns is when we start showing um, one the history of the property. You're you're well aware of from your previous fairgrounds battle scars, but I you don't know. remember any of those. What do you mean? What <laughs> do you start to? showing? <laughs> you know, new new. Uh, buildings and replacing existing buildings, you know, people get nervous and, um, you know, making sure we're coordinating. Uh, well, I think know, we have the messaging around that. Well, I, I agree 100 percent, but I mean, I think what we, we would say to, to obviously there needs to be a lot of discussion and, and input. I agree. But this is the first time an administration has put any money into the fairgrounds in as, as long as I can remember. <laughs> and, and we're and the mayor is committed to that, demonstrated that by putting dollars making dollars available and we're telling we're saying and we state that we can't go forward with a stadium project unless it also includes funds for the uh, the uh, the fairgrounds continued you know reinvestment in the fairgrounds i mean we're not trying to take away anything there we're just trying to make it better for what we what we're serving today yeah. and then i guess flat lastly just you know as we're, you're thinking through those things and you're coordinating with laura i mean just uh you know, one concern I have is, is we're, you know, we'll get this done, we're doing things, we're going to be interrupting existing operations, existing events, you know, considering how that works with our, our operational finances and, if, you know, how to fill that hole in the, in the kind of meantime. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously we've had, I've had several discussions with Laura, and obviously any time you do something that's on a scale like this, it's going to have, a, it's going to have an impact. Uh, but, you know, it, you know, again, I think we've got to look past the short period of pain and, make it work to the best we can and think about what the end result is, which we think will be, uh, you know, a tremendous facility for the city, uh, a great improvement over the existing fairgrounds facilities and, uh, you know, a new asset for the city uh, and, its, and its citizens to use going forward. Thank you. Rich, can I ask a question about bonds? Sure. Just in general or something? Just, just, in, just in general. In general. <laughs> but on the assumption that, that the city will issue bonds, this all comes together and, and we authorize those bonds. Are those proceeds for the construction of the stadium or also for the other improvements you anticipate at the fairgrounds? Currently, my thought is just for the stadium. The, the, the sports authority role would be just the revenue bonds for the stadium cost. And so maybe some public infrastructure around the stadium, but basically the stadium footprint. The, the, I would envision like we do on most other city assets, with, that doesn't, you know, we would issue general obligation bonds for the improvements for the fairgrounds. So separate. Right. 
separate track. A lot of coordination, as Kayla pointed out, would have to be done to make sure that all works together, mm -hmm. but, but it would be two different, two different bond structures, as I would say. It, the, the, the GL would be just part of a normal city a public improvement project that we do every year in terms of for sidewalks, roads, schools, right. libraries, and, and the like. Right. Um, it's an inquisitive I, group. <laughs> I, uh, I concur with Margaret about having a women's team. I think that would be wonderful. And I know some women's suffragists <laughs> that might be interested. Uh, when I uh, first saw MLS to Nashville, one of the first articles, uh, I was not a huge believer. Uh, but I saw Will's presentation to the MLS. I've seen the community get behind this. And I just want to commend Will. That presentation, uh, it was excellent. I am a believer. Uh, the community, how we've come together. So I just want to commend the whole team and Will's leadership on that. That, is, that was an excellent presentation. It's just very nice to have you guys represent our city at that level. And I think he's made some MLS believers. I, I think they've done an extraordinary job of getting us to where we are today. A lot of work to get done yet. I mean, if I, I, I had the pleasure of meeting with the commissioner when he came to town, and, and you know, you can, there's, this is not talk. They're very interested in Nashville, if we can figure this out. A lot of work to do. But they, uh, the work that they've done thus far, the local ownership sponsors, um, just the excitement over Nashville, the buzz in the, in the sports world as well as the rest of the world, uh, we, 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 this, is, this is not a pie in the sky uh, uh, where, where we were a year ago. This is something that can happen, uh, but you know, we got to figure out how to make it happen. But I do have two questions. One, with the venue group, with the icon group, did they come and look at the city and think, this is a great place for soccer, we could do this here, do that there, do that, or did you just say, come draw a soccer stadium right here? I, I, think, uh, I think we pretty much told them the fairgrounds. Okay. <laughs> I mean, just to be candid, I, I think we have looked at this for lots of reasons, and uh, uh, you know, it, it seemed to us that you know, the, the criteria for the league was you needed to be sort of downtown, near downtown. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and as we look at um, all the other development that's occurred in the city, um, we, we, we as a city, not the, really the team, said, you know, if we're going to sort of be involved in this, um, we think it needs to be uh, not in this, you know, the heart of downtown, but we'd like to see some of this development and, and city participation in other areas a little bit away from downtown area. So we sort of are still in the criteria close to downtown, but um, we see it as, a, as an ability to re reinvigorate and reinvest in our fairgrounds property, as well as sort of, it's it sort of, I mean, just kind of, it's, I mean, culturally, it sort of is at an interesting intersection. You know, you've got two intersects there, which means access is pretty good, but from a, from a cultural perspective, as the city grows and evolves, you know, you sort of have, you know, as I say, you've got, you know, Knowlesville Road with a lot of uh, new Americans, population, big soccer supporters, I mean, that's, their, that's the number one sport in uh, as well as, you know, you still have, you know, really basically Wedgwood, Blakemore, which is sort of West Nashville. So it's kind of a convergence of, uh, of really sort of Nashville. And so we think for a lot of reasons, it just seems to be the right, right location. So um, I think that Icon was basically, you know, they said, let's see how we can fit on this site. Now, if they had said, there's no way it would work there, or the commissioner of the MS, MLS said, you know, there's no way to go there, that would have been a different story. But, but they all seem to be sort of this, of this location and sort of have, uh, I guess, bought into the vision of what this redeveloped property could mean for um, existing users of the fairgrounds as well as for, for new users. And my other question about corporate sponsors, and we'll talk about the potential for corporate sponsors. Just for my timing, and I haven't done this before, um, when you come back and you say, here's the private and here's the public investment, does the private start with, can we, are corporate sponsors in that beginning period of construction, or does that come later? Um, it could be both. Okay. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, that's, you know, you sort of divide up the revenues to pay for the facility, and that's part of the negotiations that we will be doing. And I'm saying sponsor, I should be saying investment. Investment. A corporate investment. Are you talking about, like, the naming rights or something like that? Or? Yeah, and from the ground, I mean, before it's built. I would think that they would try to get naming rights before the stadium is built. Yeah. I mean, that would be part of the overall cost, you know, for the team and, and the project. <clears throat> Thank you. Are there any? Yes, Jason. I'm sorry, I'm just going back to Will. Uh, but just following up on some of your comments, Caleb, I, 
looking forward to getting more details, and I know that we don't have all those details today, but what I think we've heard so far is a structure of fair board leasing to the sports authority, and then the sports authority would have its own lease with the MLS team. And so in that process, I just need to stress that as one member of the fair board, the fair board has a long relationship with, with its stakeholders, with the racing community, with, with flea market vendors, some of whom have been there for, for years and years and years, um, other long-time users of the fairgrounds. And, and then, of course, there's the, the way the Houston neighborhood, which as a resident of the Houston neighborhood, I think is already a tremendous great neighborhood right now. Um, I'm really concerned and want to make sure that there is still mechanisms in place for the fair board to be involved with the relationship with any MLS team and ensuring that, um, with all due respect to the great folks on the Sports Authority Board. Now from an operational standpoint, we clearly. understand that the fair board is still going to be involved with that because we're going to be hearing from that community a lot. And, and, and the Sports Authority just doesn't have the experience dealing with a very large stadium of that size in yeah. directly in the middle of a residential neighborhood with, with also long-term uh, relationships with the, with the racing community and the flea market folks. And so I just want to make sure and understand that, that, that there's going to be a balance there where it all comes together. There has to be, otherwise it doesn't work. I mean, operationally, the, 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 the MLS the stadium operator has to work with the fair people. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So I'm not trying to say that there's a, that the lease with the uh, the lease is really designed to, to, to structure the you know how how the revenues flow and, and, the, and who's responsible for what. Uh, and, and the sports authority is. Again, this is, we don't have anything finalized yet, so we can change anything as we go along. But the Sports Authority has experience doing this because they do it for the other city facilities. And so that seems to be a natural fit. But has it, how it works day to day operationally, you know, I mean, I would envision that, you know, that the, that the, the fair could use, you know, aspects of the stadium or the flea market. I mean, I would think it would, it would be natural. Obviously, they can't play a game when there's a flea market. We've already talked about scheduling conflicts and those kind of things. But there would have to be a close working relationship between the operation of the fair grounds itself and the and, and MLS team to make sure there's no, you know, it's just got to work together. So what's yeah. And on the front end, you know, we've tried to do some of that on the front end, and we will continue to do that. I understand what you're saying. That clearly makes sense. I had a question probably for the MLS committee. Uh, what is the typical uh, management arrangement for a facility like, for instance, like Powers does, I think, for this in, in the Titan Stadium? And how would that look like in a joint Vanderbilt MLS? type relationship. So we don't have the details. Each city has been unique depending on its own facts and circumstances and we'll go through that now and that'll be part of what we come back to you guys on. I mean, we envision that the that the land lease is going to be with the for the operation of it will be with MLS committee, whatever they want to call themselves, and they would be responsible for that. And that's that's going to be their job. Thank you, Rich. Um, thank you so much we really appreciate the tone that the mls committee has set you guys have brought us to this point um, i think we're all at the table together i think that sets um, really the stage moving forward i think you've got the commitment of the bodies that we're willing to roll up our sleeves and help um, as as we start putting these details together uh, i know monica and laura have worked really closely together uh, but for the Fair Board uh, Commissioners, they might not realize Monica Bachmason is our Executive Director. Um, and then for our members, uh, Laura uh, Schulzer is uh, the Executive Director for uh, the Fair Board. Um, our teams uh, do work really well together. We will maintain that commitment. Um, and we're just, again, I want to commend uh, John and Mary and Will and David and and also note uh, Toby Compton, uh, our former executive director is here and has been uh, working hard in this effort. Um, we're really proud of, of the positive tone you guys have set. And I think part of that too, I want to uh, commend um, our, our folks at Nissan Stadium. Uh, we've had some su very successful uh, soccer matches uh, that helped lead us up and build this momentum. So um, it's an exciting time. Uh, we really uh, appreciate everyone and look forward to getting more details and um, you have our commitment to, um, to help uh, continue along the process and get us where we need to be so we can take a hard look at where we go from here. So there. any other questions, John? I, I just want to say thank you. We appreciate uh, the, the time and it's, it's very nice of you to, to compliment us, but it's also a tribute to Nashville. I, mean, I wouldn't and I wouldn't trade places with any of the other 11 cities that are in this competition and, and where Nashville is and, 
and the collegial collaborative nature of Nashville. I mean, people don't believe it until they get here and they see it, and, and then they're just kind of blown away by it. And very much appreciate um, being able to be here this morning and, and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Horton? No, I just, uh, I, I noticed there's a lot of uh, stakeholders and interested parties that uh, attend our meetings that uh, either represent the state fair, um, racing, and other activities. So I know they'll want to have more questions answered at our meetings. Um, but we appreciate it. Um, we'll see how this all comes together. And there'll be a lot more open meetings for, for questions and how this impacts the facility and the future use uh, for the Nashville citizens and neighborhood and such. So thank you. Thank you. Um, there are no further questions. Uh, we will adjourn this uh, a joint meeting if uh, there's a motion to adjourn, and, and then we'll take a five minute break, and the Sports Authority will uh, have our regular meeting. So. Moved. We are adjourned. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Uh, I would like to call our regular, uh, regularly scheduled monthly meeting for August for the Metro Sports Authority Board of Directors to order. And as you know, the appeals process for any action of this board can be found at the top of the agenda. Before we begin our formal agenda, um, we are very delighted to have two very special guests with us today. Um, two members of our council, uh, Council Lady uh, Johnson, Council Lady Allen, for a special um, presentation. We really appreciate your time. We know we've uh, kept you here a little bit later than intended, so thank you. So members of the Sports Authority, I would like to present a resolution number RS 2017-821 a resolution recognizing and congratulating Nashville Predators head coach Peter LaViolette, the 2016-2017 Nashville Predators ice hockey team, and the entire ice hockey staff. Whereas the Nashville Predators ice hockey team was created in Nashville in 1998, bringing professional hockey to Nashville for the first time, and whereas the team's popularity and influence on the city's cultural life has grown exponentially since those early years. And whereas the Predators have contributed significantly to the growth of Nashville through both their playing on the ice and their influence on the growth of youth hockey through their many programs, including Goal, Kids Club, Glow in the Dark, Open Skate, and Bridgestone Arena, Nashville Junior Predators, Street Pride, Hockey Plus, Hockey Rules, Predators Cup, Coaches Corner, Taking Hockey to the Streets, and their support of Nashville's two regional ice centers. And whereas the Predators achieved an extraordinary level of success in their 2016-2017 season with a winning record of 41-29-12 and winning the Western Conference Championship for the first time in their history. And whereas the team went on to play valiantly in the Stanley Cup Finals with the full support of the citizens of Nashville, giving the city a common cause to rally around and celebrate, winning two stunning games on their home ice. And whereas the superb season would not have been possible without the skillful coaching of head coach Peter LaViolette and the entire hockey staff and the masterful skating, shooting, and defending of the team's talented players. And whereas the Predators' victorious season has had an enormous impact on the city in multiple realms, including community pride, increased tourism, economic impact, youth sports, and many other aspects, and will, and will reverberate throughout Nashville for years to come. And whereas it is fitting and proper that the Metropolitan Council recognize and applaud the Nashville Predators team for their extraordinary achievements both on and off the ice this season while setting a positive example for the youth of Nashville and Davidson County. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, Section 1, that the Metropolitan Council on behalf of the citizens of Nashville thanks the Nashville Predators for their excellence in athleticism, teamwork, persistence, grit, 
and for the joy of supporting their efforts in a united community spirit. Because of their her her Herculean <laughs> achievements, we declare August 17, 2017 to be Nashville Predators Day in Woo! Nashville and Davidson County. <laughs> signed by all 40 members of our council. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you to the council for honoring our predators. We, um, we will all keep cheering for the Preds. We're very proud. Thank you. We appreciate you coming today. The board has our minutes from our June 15th uh, meeting before us. Um, are there any revisions? Any corrections? If not, at this time we'll move adopt. Okay. Motion and second. Uh, all in favor to approve the minutes. Aye. 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 The minutes are approved. At this time, we will hear from Monica Hockston, our executive director for the ED report. Monica. Thank you. Good morning, Good morning. everyone. <laughs> Thank you for staying with us. We'll try to move this along as, as quickly as we can and take care of what we need to do. Um, you have the agenda before you. There are three items that will require board action this morning. The first one is item four, consideration of a resolution to accept a donation from the Nashville Breastfeeding Coalition, and I will speak more about that shortly. Also, item five, you'll hear from the personnel committee, um, and they will bring a recommendation for consideration of an executive director's open range increase. And then finally, what we'll do in the interest of time and, and in case any of the board needs to leave, we will swap items seven and eight, and the board will be asked to consider the cleaning services agreement between Powers Management and Janie King of Nashville, and then following action on that item, then we'll hear from, um, from, the, from the Bridgestone Arena and the Nashville Predators. But we want to make sure that in case any of you have to go, that we still have a quorum at that point. Um, I have a few updates, and I'll try to keep this very brief. You know, we, we did not meet in July, but as I'm sure you all know, and, and we communicated to you on July 4th during the, the fireworks show, there was a shell that misfired and caused some damage to the west side upper deck, um, essentially a hole. Uh, the Titans and the project management team have been working on the remediation. Um, there are some steel beams that were installed for support. Um, concrete is being patched and the seats are being replaced. All of this work will be done by Saturday in time for the Titans preseason game, I think at 2 o'clock. Um, also on behalf of our project management team who had to leave, um, we want to report that phase three work at the stadium is complete. That was some work to the West Club, um, some of the sealants and, and expansion joints. Um, final accounting is in progress, but also the Titans reimbursements for phase one and phase two have been completely um, have paid, and so we've closed that piece out. Um, there are a couple of events that I want to mention. I know you're already familiar with them. This Monday, the Sports Authority with the Sounds and the Mayor's Office will be hosting an Eclipse viewing party at First Tennessee Park. Um, you have the press release and I believe a timeline in your packets. The event begins at 11 o'clock. Um, full, the full eclipse or totality is at 1.25 and will last for about two minutes, maybe just under two minutes. Um, the, the event concludes at 2 o'clock, and then the ballpark will close for an hour and will reopen at 3 o'clock for the Sounds game against the Iowa Cubs. Okay. So um, there will be free parking and shuttling from Lot R over at Nissan Stadium to First Tennessee Park. Uh, the response has been extremely good. I believe the Sounds expect to sell the last of the tickets today. Probably almost 
So yeah, less than 500 remain. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. We really hope that you'll be able to, to come. It's been a, a tremendous effort um, by the Sports Authority. Quentin has worked tirelessly on this along with, with Doug and Adam and their team at the Sounds and also the Mayor's Office. So it should be a great event. Um, secondly, on August 29th, also at First Tennessee Park, we will be hosting, along with the Sounds, the Titans, Metro Health Department, and our community partners, a ribbon cutting for the Mamava. You remember the Mamavas are the, the breastfeeding suites that are mobile and will be at the ballpark and at um, Nissan Stadium and also deployed to certain Metro special events. So we, again, have been working very hard on that. We're excited about it. Um, there will be an open house and tours that will begin at 6.15, and then we'll have a program at 6.30, and then the sound's first pitch is at 7.05. So um, please contact our office, give us a call if you're interested, and come in. We're really excited to be able to provide this for moms and babies across the city. Are there any questions? That concludes my report. Thank you, Monica. I know I plan on attending on Monday the um, clips, so hopefully if other board members are, are able, maybe we could all uh, meet up, so maybe after the meeting we can talk to Quentin about uh, some of the details on that. Uh, it's going to be an exciting day for Nashville. Uh, and then moving on, it looks like next step is uh, we need to formally approve the resolution to accept the donation for the Mamava. Uh, I will still move. We have a motion and a second to approve the resolution for a $500 donation from the Nashville Breastfeeding Coalition to support the fiscal year 2018 Sports Authority PIP. Motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. And next we have the personnel committee report and our vice chair, Kathy Bender, will give us that committee report. Good morning, everyone. Um, the Personnel Committee met uh, early this morning. Uh, we had a great meeting and um, we had one task and that was to uh, consider the um, open range pay increase for our executive director. Um, I will say that the feedback to Monica was extremely positive and we feel very good about the direction that the board has moved in over the course of the last 12 months. Um, and not only Monica, but we salute the entire team. You all have done a fantastic job, and uh, we just appreciate all the effort. What I need to do is to uh, the recommendation. Well, the bottom line is that there's a standard two percent increase, and uh, the open range allows to increase up to five percent. So there's a three percent option to increase the salary for our executive director, and it was the recommendation of the personnel committee to extend the three percent. Uh, addition to Monica's salary. So I would entertain a motion. I'll be pleased to move we accept the recommendation of our committee. Second. Motion, and there is a second. Um, there's is any further discussion? All in uh, motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The Thank motion you. is accepted. Thank you, Chair Lady Bender. And um, Next up, we are at facility questions. Um, in our packet, as, as usual, uh, we have a committee refer facility information from both the Predators and Sounds. Um, even though they're not on the formal agenda today, if there are any questions, we could entertain those at this time. I know Janine is here, and, and I see Doug as well. So, seeing none. Uh, now we will hear from Bridgestone Arena for um, their portion of the agenda, and it looks like we will first take up the cleaning services agreement, and Kyle will kick us off on that. So uh, we, uh, it's kind of time where we need to uh, re uh, find a new cleaning services company. We, uh, Good morning, first, uh, Kyle Clayton. Sorry, Kyle Clayton, Bridgestone. Director of Operations for the Bridgestone <laughs> Arena. Um, what I'd like to do is introduce you to Dave Urso. He came on board within the past, I don't know, three or four months or so. And uh, he's got excellent experience in the industry. Uh, he can tell you a little bit more about that, but we really brought him on board to tackle certain projects like this, and he's hit a home run with this one. So he's gonna come up and talk a little bit about our RFP process and how we came to the selection that we did. Dave? 
Hi, David Urso. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we uh, started this process of uh, looking for a new cleaning company, not looking for a new cleaning company, but testing the market on the cleaning company. Over the last several months, we began the process by uh, interviewing seven or eight cust uh, different companies. We were uh, facing increasing cleaning costs and we were facing the expiration of our current contract, so we thought it was prudent, probably in our best interest, to just test the market on janitorial services. So we, uh, SMS, by the way, has done a fabulous job over the last eight years, but we thought it was a good time to uh, just see what else was out there, if there was something better out there, if we could uh, push the envelope a little bit on our, uh, on our cleaning services. And, uh, to that end, we started with uh, seven or eight different companies that we talked to. I say seven or eight, not because I don't know the number, but one company we invited in and they never showed up for the meeting, so that was uh, number eight. So uh, we, uh, the initial process began with us interviewing those companies. Some of those companies we reached out to, other companies reached out to us in the normal course of their business, uh, just testing the waters to see if the, uh, the business was out there. But we had uh, several criteria that we used to, uh, to narrow it down to four for the formal RFP process. We looked at their ability to clean the building, demonstrated ability to clean the building. We looked at uh, local ownership. We looked at their minority-owned business status. We looked at uh, management or ownership involvement in the business. And uh, going through that process, we narrowed it down to four companies. One was Jana King of Nashville, which is a uh, locally owned company and minority owned business. Uh, SMS, which was the incumbent. Pritchard Stadium and Arena Company, which was the previous company to uh, SMS. They cleaned the building the last time it was put out for RFP. And uh, Service Master, which was a Memphis based company and also minority owned. So we sent out a formal RFP to, uh, to those four companies. And the timing of this RFP process, it was, uh, it was designed to be fairly quick and fairly quiet. And we did it that way just because when you start to put out contracts, you know, we were concerned about continuity of service. What happens to the management staff here when they find out that there's a potential that uh, there's gonna be a new company? What happens to the employees? So we were concerned that uh, continuity of service would, uh, would, might suffer if, uh, if the process went on too long. So to that end, we chose to uh, send out the, the RFP to those four companies. And uh, the RFP response decision was based on similar things. We were looking at uh, the ability to clean the building, a consistent and identifiable workforce or staff, and cost. In our initial meetings, we didn't have any discussions of cost, but uh, in the final RFP process, cost was an important factor. So uh, what stood out to us for, uh, for Janet King of Nashville was their unique approach to staffing. They have kind of a three-tiered model with the master franchisee, individual franchises in the, in the Tennessee and Nashville market. There's 74 franchises in the local market, which they will tap into to uh, clean the building. And they also have corporate oversight from their uh, corporate offices in Dallas. So we thought that three-tiered approach was, uh, was pretty good and pretty effective for us. Uh, they have an ability to background check all of the employees who come into the building. They don't use temps, temporary services, like a lot of the other cleaning companies do. So we were very concerned about, you know, for safety and security purposes, who gets in the building, and we know who's coming in the building. And uh, the other companies could not demonstrate to that as effectively as Jana King. Uh, local management involvement or local ownership involvement, the, uh, the management and ownership of uh, Jana King is local and very involved. They came uh, highly recommended from reference checks that we did, both uh, as a company and individually, the people who will be involved. Uh, they also seem to have a passion for the business that a lot of companies don't. They have a strong passion for cleaning. When they tell you your floors are going to pop in a meeting and they're excited about it, you, know, you kind of get excited about cleaning as much as you can get excited about cleaning. And uh, the final determination was cost. And their cost significantly lower than the other companies have bid, about 35% lower than uh, the, uh, the other finalists. So those were the reasons that we, uh, we chose Janet King. We're looking for, we're looking at a two-year contract with a two-year option, mutual option for the, for the second two years. That's the, uh, I guess, the contract that's before us now, we're waiting for your approval. Thank you, Dad. All right. Uh, questions Any for questions? Dad? Uh, OK, 
Okay. At this time, I believe we will entertain a motion for approval for the cleaning services agreement between Powers Management and Jana King of Nashville. So moved. Second. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries and we are approved. At this time, we will now be wowed by the Bridgestone Arena and Predators report. All right. Thank you. Do you remember the last time we were in this building together? It was April the 20th, which happened to be game four of the opening round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. We were playing Chicago that night. We were up three games to no, to zero. Um, who would have thought that night we'd have won four to one and would have catapulted us on to a Stanley Cup final run that nothing oh. is. <laughs> Ever, nobody except for Sean Henry, of course. Um, you know, that victory that night really put us on the national spotlight. It was one of those that captured the attention of everybody, and it just catapulted us to a run that no one had seen before. Well, today's presentation, we really want to talk about just a quick recap of the playoffs. Just live in the moment for a minute, enjoy it again and again and again, and then look forward to what's coming this next season because there's even more exciting things to come. Um, we actually have a quick video that will kick everything off. Um, after that, our very own Pete Weber, who happens to be for the fifth time a uh, Tennessee sportscaster of the year, voted on by the national sports media. He'll come up and say a few words after that, and we'll just get going. Pete. city you know something good is going on people want to support it and, and I hope we uh, you know we made it a fun a couple of months ago oh it's the best the best ring in my opinion best fans in the in the league a great fan base which is growing all the time sharing so it's been great like you come in your building and you have so much belief in in, in your team that we're, we're so good in this building and, and we know what the fans are gonna gonna be behind us and, and cheer for us all the way so it's the best atmosphere i've ever experienced and been a part of playoffs the fans really stepped it up and that was an incredible experience and the support that we get from our fan base is you know, incredible. Always behind us, always supportive, always pretty loud at the game. So uh, you know, there's always that extra little motivation to know that they're they're behind us no matter what is uh, is pretty special. There's six people on the ice for Nashville. They clearly do have a seventh man. They've got a big flag up top. This crowd is unbelievable. It really it makes a difference, Kenny. It truly does.
I think it's the best building in the NHL. Most everyone in the lower bowl standing. Along now, Goodrow scores. That's something you will you will never forget in your in your life. I feel like we we really brought this city together and, and, and made them made them cheer for something. And, uh, I've never experienced anything anything like that. And, we really kind of changed the hog the world a bit. What an atmosphere here in Nashville. Again, we repeat ourselves. It's been amazing. We always feel supported. And it's, it's a great building and, and great fans. And obviously, personally, I want to say thank you to all the fans. It's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, it just makes it fun coming to the rink every day and enjoying those atmospheres together and, and playing our hearts out for, for this city. as myself, to be able to bring Woodstock to downtown Nashville and eliminate some of the nudity and the drug usage, I think was a great thing, an absolutely great thing. Uh, glad to be in front of you here uh, this afternoon. Now, it's still morning. We've still got two minutes, so I'm going to try to end this before it becomes high noon. Since everything ended with the Stanley Cup playoffs and the Predators on June 11th, here is what has happened. Assistant coach Phil Housley has left to become head coach of the Buffalo Sabres. David Poyle was voted by his peers as the National Hockey League's General Manager of the Year. We lost James Neal. We had to lose one player in the expansion draft to Las Vegas. At the entry draft in Chicago, Predators taking six players, including Ely Toivonen of Finland in the first round, and at least one draft analysis gave the Predators an A for all of that, adding it was arguably the Predators' best draft in recent years hosted a prospect camp shortly after the draft here for 30-plus prospects, recent draft picks, and youngsters in the system. Signed free agent Nick Bonino from Pittsburgh. If you can't beat him, sign him. That's what we did there. Traded Colin Wilson to Colorado. Acquired veteran defenseman Alexei Amelin via Las Vegas. He had been an expansion draft choice there, but most recently had played with Montreal. Signed players here to new deals. Frederick Gaudreau, Pontus Auberg, Austin Watson, and Victor Arvidsson. Hired Dan Muse, an assistant coach, while promoting Kevin McCarthy to associate coach. Signed Ryan Johansson to the biggest deal in franchise history. Captain Mike Fisher then announced his retirement most recently. Now here's what's to come yet. The players returning to camp, returning to town, and beginning their own workouts. Rookies report September 7th and then head to Florida for the annual rookie tournament. Veterans are entered September 14th, so preseason games at Florida on September 19th, or versus Florida on September 19th. Home preseason games the 28th against Columbus and the 30th against Tampa Bay. Folks, I'll let you catch your breath. The regular season opening up October 5th at Boston, then October 7th at Pittsburgh. And the home opener and banner raising for the Western Conference champions as we open the 20th season Tuesday, October the 10th, against the Philadelphia Flyers. I hope you are ready for that. It is now afternoon, and I will introduce you to Jerry Helper. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Pete. Good afternoon. Uh, I had about 20 minutes of comments, but I'm going to shorten them so we can get you out of here in time for dinner. Uh, I've had the, uh, I, I'm pinch hitting for Rebecca King, who I know has spoken to you before about our community relations and our foundation efforts. And I've had the good fortune of being with the organization for 20 years and uh, have never been more proud to be a part of the organization than what we experienced uh, these past several months. It has been overwhelming. What was equally rewarding, though, in addition to the going to the Stanley Cup Finals, the national attention, the economic impact, though, was the impact our franchise has been able to make off the ice and in the community and to help others. And I've said it for a number of years that, you know, pro sports franchises have an unbelievable platform 
and they have an opportunity to make a difference in other people's lives and impact other organizations. And the playoffs really helped us spotlight that in terms of all the fun things that we were doing, whether it was a smash car out front of the building. Uh, we did some fundraising to help the flood relief efforts in St. Louis when we were playing them during uh, the second round of the playoffs. We had the viewing parties that you may remember. The one in particular, uh, we asked for donations for that, that event, for the, the event that drew over 13, 14,000 people here. And from the money that we raised for that, we donated $50,000 to the Nashville Public Education Fund uh, in an effort to give back. And actually, as part of that, we challenged other businesses that benefited from the playoff run to do likewise. So again, an example, hopefully, how we can help others and encourage others to, to join in. Uh, we were fortunate that uh, just after the last meeting, we had our annual grant distribution. And it was our largest grant distribution in uh, foundation history, over $500,000 to 130 different organizations within this community. Uh, and again, through the playoffs, we had an unbelievable run in terms of our silent auction throughout the, uh, the playoffs. So we've already generated about $300,000 that will go towards next year's efforts. So we've got a great starting point already. Our friends at Nissan, uh, through the excitement of the playoffs, they specially created a Nissan Auto that is actually out in the uh, uh, atrium there. It is available for auction, so if any of you are interested, it has a value of about $110,000, and we have a bid already of over $100,000, and it will be awarded uh, coinciding with our opening of the season. So uh, another great opportunity to raise money for, for needy causes and efforts within the community. Uh, as Pete mentioned, we had our prospect camp in uh, late June, early July. We had all of those 30 players go out in the community. Part of their orientation into the organization is we take them out into the community, whether it's hosting a youth hockey clinic, whether it's visiting hospitals. We really help them understand what it means to be a pro uh, member of the Nashville Predators and what the responsibility is to give back. So we've started that, and uh, you know, we're already looking ahead to the coming season. Matthias Ekholm has stepped in to uh, take over our Make-A-Wish clinic, which James Neal had done for a couple of years. We've already got over 100 kids signed up for that in early September, and that just leads right into our annual uh, First Tennessee Brent Peterson Celebrity Golf Tournament on September 11th, and then Petey's Party, which those two events go to generate funds for both the foundation and Peterson Foundation for Parkinson's. So uh, we have a lot that we've already done, a lot in the works for what we think is going to be another record season as we go forward. So I wanted to share that background as it relates to our community relations and foundation efforts. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to David Kells. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Hi, I'm David Kells with the Bridgestone Arena and the Nashville Predators. Um, I kind of want to echo some of the th thoughts of the playoffs that we've heard, and I believe some of the MLS group said this as well. Uh, when we were dealing with the NHL, they were amazed at how collaborative and how um, wonderful it was that everybody in the city was willing to work together. Um, we'd not been to the Stanley Cup final before, so we were the ones crashing the party. We were the ones that were uh, doing something at the same time that was traditionally CMA Festival. But it was amazing to see everybody come together and work together to make it all happen and with a smile. So, you know, big thanks to everybody at Metro Police and the fire department, uh, the mayor's office, the CVC, the CMA, Public Works. Every time a goofy new wonderful idea came up, like putting Luke Bryan on a roof, the answer was yes, how do we do it? And you, the NHL repeatedly said that doesn't happen anywhere else. Nobody else is willing to use the whole community, the music um, industry, and everybody to come together to be part of one amazing event. So it's a, it's, a, it's a testament to what you guys see every day, what we all know how the city works, but it was great to be able to showcase that to others. Um, with that long playoff run, we have a truncated summer. Every summer we do a bunch of new arena improvements. Um, we like to think we're like an amusement park. You need a new ride every year to show people that you, uh, what's going on. No different this year. Uh, hopefully we get used to this new truncated uh, schedule in the summer. Um, but we are rolling out things in the upper deck um, to make, the, make those fans have accommodations and uh, amenities on par with other parts of the arena. So uh, after this
just feel free to take a walk and see where we're putting hammers and walls and putting up drywall and putting in new bars and new restrooms and new viewing areas. Uh, we also have some things going on backstage that people don't see. So we've redone our media lounge. We've do redone the bathrooms for the stagehand crew. And those things to make amenities for the folks who work here all day, every day on event days. Um, to let them know, hey, it's a comfortable place to be, it's a place that functions well, and um, they can have a great day at work. Um, since last we met, uh, another Polestar ranking has come out. So for the first half of 2017, we finished fifth in the United States and 19th in the world in concert attendance. And it sounds like a broken record because we keep hitting these records all the time, but it's awesome to show the consistency, to show that what we did was not just a one-time blip, that we weren't didn't have one busy year and then we trade off, that this is a con consistent area, this is where Nashville is going to be for a long, long time. Um, we are currently at the tail end of an 11 event in 20 day run. In that, uh, in that run it included Shawn Mendes, Queen, two Tim and Faith shows, John Mayer, Matchbox 20, Roger Waters, and this week we finish with something that's uh, pretty cool. We have Earth, Wind and Fire tonight and then tomorrow starts a two day run of pro bull riding. We've never done bull riding on a one day to the show load in. So Earth, Wind and Fire will load out tonight, dump trucks will start coming at, the, at who knows what time in the morning, 1 a.m. or whatever, and then by tomorrow night we'll have a full dirt show load in. And this just goes to show again that cooperative spirit that our staff and the promoters for two separate events, they didn't have to play well in the sandbox, but they, they did. And so there was a pre-rig yesterday with some of the Earth, Wind and Fire's gear, some of the bull riding gear, they shared staff, they shared crews, they got that up, they'll get that out, the earth, wind, and fire stuff out tonight, in with the bull riding, in with the dirt, in with the boys, in with the cowboys, and in with the fans tomorrow night. Um, later this month, we'll also be hosting an open house. Um, again, kind of uh, continuing the off-season sales initiatives, but this is when the ice is going in. So uh, August 24th, we'll start putting ice in. We've invited out some season ticket holders to help paint the lines and the logos and all of those wonderful things. So the next time you come in here, it'll be cold. Bring your jackets, bring your long pants. Um, but it's just another season that hockey is, or another showing that hockey is about to start back. And uh, looking ahead, um, in the 2016, 2000. 17th fiscal year, we hosted 56 non-hockey events. And this lumps the multi-day things like Disney on Ice and SEC as one event. That's kind of how we do it on our budgeting cycle. Uh, for the 2017-2018 cycle, we've projected 76 events. So again, this is another milestone, another benchmark in, uh, for us. And I used to get scared to death every time we set a new record. It's like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do next year? And now the confidence is there, the consistency is there, that we're just going to continue to hit those marks and keep going as we go forward. Any questions for me? I've got one quick question. Shoot. Um, on the 76 events, are, are y'all reaching out to other people or people just wanting to come to Bridgestone? It's a two-way street. Um, mm -hmm. Because we've had that success, we're on people's radar. Um, people see that a show can come here, can be successful. They see that the show can gross as much money as it can in any, any market. But at the same time, you know, we call folks and we want to do more and more and more. So maybe the folks who didn't think they could be successful here, we give them a call, make a pitch and make it sound like, yes, this is something we can do. So it is a two-way street. Nice. Thanks. Great. All right, and now I'll pass it off to Kyle. Thank you, Debbie. So like Hills was talking about, all these events that we're doing, just to give you kind of a financial impact uh, for over the last year. Uh, actually, let's look back even further, talking about sales tax growth within this these four walls, 501 Broadway. Uh, the first year the team was here in 1999, gross sales tax in this uh, building was generated about $4 million. Uh, the playoffs this past year generated about $3.5 million just by itself. Overall, last year, we generated about $15 million just in sales tax alone. Just to show you how far we've come in such a short bit of time, it's really uh, contributable to this uh, wonderful staff we have here. Looking at last year, financially, uh, revenues reached $15 million for the first time, franchise history. Uh, the previous year, we were at 12 and a half, 12 the year before that, and 10.6 back in 2014. So we, again, you see that steady growth. Obviously, as events are going up, we expect our revenues to grow as well. It's one of those that we uh, pride ourselves on being able to do that. Uh, our largest year-over-year -year growth in a revenue center was our food and beverage uh, revenue. It came in four and a half million dollars uh, this past year, which is about a million dollars in growth, about 32 percent. And it's one of those where I think it was 2015. We came before you guys with a contract extension for our partner DNC, and as part of that contract extension, they uh, invested in our food court that year. I think it was two million dollars they put in, and we're really seeing the benefits of those investments right now. And uh, actually, as I get further along, I'll show you. I'll talk about some more investment that they're about to put in this year, as David was talking about some projects that are going on. Um, 
as it becomes the, closer to the end of the year, we start looking at our financial performance and where we're at and you know the way our lease works out. There's a performance fee that we could take home at the end of the day of their savings versus our operating expenses. Uh, last year, we communicated about six or $700,000 of profit that we for, were gone on and we actually invested it back into the building. This year, same story. We're investing about $750,000 of that money to go back into the building. And a lot of those areas are ones that David mentioned. So our hospitality areas, such as uh, the meeting rooms, actually the meeting rooms behind us, we updated those as well to match these. Uh, the Patron Club got a little bit of a facelift and some AV. Uh, the Lexus Lounge is gonna get a little bit more uh, facelift in there. Uh, David mentioned the restrooms, both concourse and backstage, we're touching those. Uh, improving our hockey board system, safety of our players, and just the fan experience, we're up upgrading those uh, boards. Uh, during the Stanley Cup final, we had some technical broadcast, uh, we'll call them issues, but we upgraded the fiber and things like that, so we won't have those anymore. And it was it was essential during the Stanley Cup final to have those in place. Also, as a 20-year-old building, HVAC mechanical systems are starting to show their wear and tear, so we're obviously investing in those to upgrade those. And then David Kells can't have a concert here without a stage. It's one of those that we've talked about for a while. We're going to replace that stage this year. So again, foregoing that profit to invest back in the building uh, for those projects. Uh, as I mentioned a second ago, DNC, our partner in the food and beverage world, they extended the contract in 2015. Um, as part of that contract in 2017, they were supposed to invest about half a million dollars into the facility. When the amazing success that we had this past season, it really made us all think things a little differently. They've actually pulled forward some investment. We're gonna have about a million to a million and a half invested this summer in this building. So most of that will be on the 300 level concourse with some revamping a set concession stand or two and then actually adding a few more. We'll add about, I think it's 14 to 15 points of sale. So the speed of service will increase. There'll be more options for fans, some new uh, offerings up there. So really it's gonna help our overall business strategy, obviously on the revenue side, but also fan interaction or fan relations. They sh should really improve there as well. And then as part of that contract, there will be additional invest further along as previously stated. Um, also on top of that, so non-contracted, they are investing in a hospitality area down on our event level. They've, uh, we pitched it to them and they've accepted that. So it's one of those that's not contracted. They've uh, bought into what we're, we're doing here. So it's one of those we're really excited to have that. So as I talk about all these projects that we're doing, some of them might sound familiar that they were on our latest SIP request back in May that we uh, brought before you guys in that May 1st meeting. Uh, so with the news of all this funding and everything like that, there are, I think there were five different projects that were on that list. All of them have been touched, about three of them have been completely wiped off that request. So we're trying to unload the burden of SIF with using our operating funds and all these projects that we want to do. It's one of those, I hope we see that as a partnership with you guys, how much we value everything. This building is where we want to be for the future and so we know that we need to invest our share of it. And so hopefully you, you guys will recognize that as we keep doing year over year. Even with all these uh, investments and projects and everything that's going in and through our operating costs and also our partners uh, investments, our operating expenses are only up about 14% over last year, but we still came in in the better bottom line last year by about $272,000, so, and also over half a million better than our budget. So again, we're able to do all these things because of our incredible performance, obviously on the ice, in the concert world, and uh, it just makes this building and this city just stand out beyond others. Um, I have a couple of slides that I'll show you for the projects real quick, and we mentioned there's a walk afterwards. I know we're way past time, so if anybody wants to stay and walk, I'll be happy to walk you to a few of these locations. Obviously, we have a show today, so things will be a little bit jumbled, but uh, we have some renderings that we'll show you real quick, and if you have time, we'll, we'll walk it afterwards. One thing that I did not mention is our ownership group and our leadership, it's one of those, uh, our locker room has not been touched since 2010 when we had the flood. We did a quick uh, renovation to that space. It's one of those, we've been looking to do it. We had our partners at Populous come on board and design a pretty impressive locker room. It's one of those things that we'll be privately funding over the next, I think it's a two year process, but the actual room itself will get upgraded this summer. It's actually gutted right now, it's a blank slate. But here's a rendering of what it will look like when it's done. That gold band around the top is actually an LED ribbon board. Mm -hmm. So it can show player shots above their, their lockers or it'll be a, uh, any kind of streaming message that we wanna show to the coach. Uh, straight back, you'll see that big TV screen. That is actually a digital whiteboard that the coach will be able to draw on and do his plays and things like that. But it's really just a clean, curved approach so everybody's looking at each other. It's a much more team unified room. It's, it's just updating where we were in 2010. Oh, I got the clicker, I think. 
Um, this is the event level hospitality that we were talking about. There'll be two identical units similar to this. And this will be almost an extension of the Lexus Lounge. It'll be a private space for whoever has purchased or rented that space for the night. Uh, again, right now it's a big empty slate right now ready to uh, get all the finishes put in. But uh, again, this is the part that DNC uh, invested separately from what they're contracted to to uh, put this in. This was also on our SIP request. Uh, so as we talked about DNC, their contracted amount they're going to invest and they went above and beyond. There's three stands on the upper level that we have identified that we are renovating right now. This one was currently a uh, just a bar that had about four or five point of sales. And there was a uh, fan relations information center right next adjacent to it. We actually relocated that to another side of the building and expanded that bar so it'll service a lot more people as it gets really congested on that side of the building. Um, this was an underutilized area that was kind of a makeshift grab and go. And there was also a funnel cake next to it. We cleaned all that up. It's now gonna be kind of a frozen drink, margarita type bar. It's a different offering offering upstairs for our, uh, our fans on the third level. And then this is a more formal grab and go that was actually a storage space. Sean Henry hates storage, so we're trying to find as much storage as possible and convert it to a revenue generating operation. So this will be a nice little uh, grab and go, similar to the one, the twice daily we, we had down on the uh, 100 level right now. Um, so with that, oh, that's a whole lot of information in about three minutes, sorry. Um, if you have any questions on any of that, you know, fire away now if you want to email me later. Obviously, you can, more than happy to answer that. Uh, Kyle, I just want to thank the Predators for this $750,000 investment that is not required. It's just done just because it's a good thing to do. So the citizens of Nashville appreciate the Predators on so many levels, but I just know as being part of this body, we really appreciate that. And we also really appreciate you talking to the concessionaire and having them do something very similar to what you're doing and uh, what they don't have to do and making these improvements. It's very impressive. So thank you for bringing that to our attention and thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to say, um, I was really pleased to hear all the investment in the third level, those fans, deserve, they put their heart and soul in this building Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, deserve a lot of credit. So I'm glad that they're getting the uh, extra attention that they deserve. So um, thank you. Are there any other questions for Kyle? Anything else that I'll bring up? Sean Henry, hopefully to close you out and uh, abbreviate it for Yeah, real brief. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say good morning, but can't do that anymore, I guess. Uh, I really will be brief. Uh, I just want to say thank you, sure. you know, for letting us continue to talk and talk and talk and talk today. Uh, but over the past, I guess, two months since we went on kind of a nice run, we've gotten a lot of congratulations, a lot of thanks, a lot of proclamations, awards, really nice things. People buy us dinner now and drinks when we're out. Not me, but Dave and Kyle and those guys. Uh, but it really has been incredible. With all that said, we haven't done anything yet. Remember what our goal is. It's really, really simple to be the number one sports entertainment facility built around a Stanley Cup championship team. We we're close. You could argue a whistle or two here or there. I'm not blaming any officiating, of course. <laughs> you know, because them. Um, they never decide a game, I know. But we didn't achieve it. But we sure did get close. And we are the best venue in America. You know, we get those awards virtually every year. ESPN says we have the best experience in, in sports. Those are great, but without two more wins, it really means nothing. What I'm excited about is we're poised to continue where we are. From a roster standpoint, we've never had a better team. From a locked-in standpoint, we have an opportunity to do this for the next four, five, six, seven, eight years, ideally match the Red Wings record of 25 straight playoff appearances. That's what we're striving for. But because of our staff, because of David Poyle, because of our hockey operations department, the way we scout, the way we train, we're gonna be in this hunt for a long, long time. The only thing I'm scared about is will we ever be able to replicate what happened April, May, and June. You know, that first time is special, no matter what it is. And it really was something that was incredible. The city poured out. Uh, one of our players in the video said, uh-oh, the secret's out. People know what we are now, but it's true. We knew what we were. This was a powder keg for our fans, waiting to blow up. We gave them something to get excited about. The Titans did so 17, 18 years ago. We just did it. Ideally, this year, we both hit the playoffs together, and we start getting really competitive at the same time. We bring soccer to the city, and really the vision that was put together with the sports authorities formation around our arrival 
really can take this city up to another level. Sports transcends a city. I think we saw that with 50 to 100,000 people in the streets celebrating together. People that were not hockey fans, not sports fans, maybe not music fans, but one or the other all collided together on that great game six. The game ended the wrong way, but when you look at what happened that day before the CMA Festival finale over at the stadium, there were probably 100,000 people in the streets. 40, 45 of which went over to the stadium, 17 or so went inside of our building, and the rest stayed out on Broadway. And it was about 117 degrees out. There was no reason for anyone to be out there. The worst TV you could watch is a projection screen from a rooftop or from 200 feet away, but people did it. It really was amazing. It's our job now to get back to where we were. With all of that said, we aren't where we are without your board. And we mean that sincerely. You guys haven't gotten a proclamation. You're not getting your bar tabs picked up. Again, neither am I. I'm still waiting. If anyone's listening. But you guys don't get the proper credit. Nor, nor can we, Margaret Darby. Oh, fun police over there. Huh? Uh, well, I'll remember that. I'll, I'll always offer that. I'll get really alligator arms on it. Uh, but I mean, seriously, we talk about our public-private partnership all the time. We're the envy of sports in North America right now. And that's why MLS wants to be here. You guys have created something really, really special. It was 10 years ago when this team almost left. It was 10 years ago that we didn't have our finest days as a franchise. We had an owner go to jail. We had a lot of issues coming out of that. We violated a lot of our, not violated, but we really skirted the, the fine lines of our agreements together. But you guys rode through it. You rode through a lot of difficulties with us. Ideally, for what just create, you know, just happened, and ideally what will happen in the next few weeks. So really just want to say thank you to you. You guys don't get the proper credit from yourselves to the mayor's office and everyone that we work with. It was an incredible run, but it means nothing if we don't get two more wins. And I look at her when I say it because you should have seen the text she sent me that night. It was awful. So disappointed, so angry. Now I know how venomous that lawyer can be. But seriously, I just want to say thank you on behalf of our organization, what you have done for this franchise really over 20 years, but more importantly over the past 10 years is nothing short of remarkable because most boards would have bailed. Most boards would have said, we don't buy into the vision. We don't understand where you're going because look at where you've been. And you were just the opposite. You really bought into the owners that were here. You bought into Mayor Dean's vision and the partnership that we created. It, it really is remarkable. So I just want to say thank you. And more importantly, a lot of teams, when they reach where we are right now, kind of coast. You look at where you are, figure, okay, we're just going to raise ticket prices, we'll raise sponsorships, we'll do this. We don't need to invest in things because we have the fans, right? We won. They're ours. You just heard a lot of things that we're doing right now. We're investing another, I don't know what the number is, Kyle, four or five million dollars into the building. We almost yawn at that now because we've done so much over the years. But it is important to continue to move that forward. And as you mentioned, it's great to do so in the upper bowl first and then drift that on down you know, through the rest of the building. But with that, we've also added staff. We've added new training equipment, new trainers, new coaches to our team to kind of take that forward because we didn't win. And that's why I love our chairman, Tom Segrin. What he said the Monday after we lost, he said, okay, what do we need to do to take that next step? Well, again, giving David Poyle complete freedom to rebolster our roster and more importantly in our building, what do we need to do to continue to bring new partners and make the fan experience better? And then we added to our staff as well, and we continue to add it. We now have the largest service staff for tickets, sponsorships, and, and uh, suites in the NHL and the NBA, so arena sports. We have more service people per account this year than we did last year, where, again, normally you kind of start you know, switching that over. And that was my buzzer. It's like the orchestra playing. Um, <laughs> but we're investing in it. You heard from Dave Urso a little while ago. What we didn't do is really introduce Dave uh, properly. Dave knows the ancillary services better than anyone in our industry. He was the regional vice president for sports service, or DNC. I think they're getting tired of us hiring their employees because we hired Dave. Right before that, we hired Tom Gallo, who was our GM. But we really do believe that our food and beverage side, our, our CSC guest services, our cleaning side, isn't just the responsibility of our subcontractor. We want to bring people in to make it that much better, to really manage it with them. And you're seeing the results with, with our cleaning company. You see our food and beverage results. You see the enhanced investment they're making in our facility, that's all because of Dave. He's a you know, 30-year veteran. You're 30 years, right? Dave, you're 50? Dave just turned 50 recently, so you can wish him a happy birthday. Some of us are not there yet. 
Um, <laughs> but he, he started at a great building. He opened up the Palace of Auburn Hills. He renovated and opened up uh, Jacksonville Stadium or whatever it's called now with the Jaguars. He opened up uh, Tropicana Field with the Rays and renovated that. And he, he really is a transformation guy. And I think by having him with us, it's going to add to us again. So when we're standing before you each month or whenever we host it, you're going to hear more and more of these stories because of the investment we're making in our staff. But again, I just want to say thank you to all of you guys in a really long, long, long-winded way. Well, our partnership is incredible. And it wouldn't so if it weren't for you guys giving so much of yourself and believing in what we said we could do. I remember my first meeting seven years ago, I think next week, it was awful. I mean, I think three of you were there. It was the most miserable day of my life. And I think we vowed to you that we would never have that meeting again. And fortunately, there's no wood up here, but knock on something, we, not, we haven't had it. Not because of anything we did, because of the faith that you guys had in us. So thank you very much. And with that, I think Quentin has some gifts for you. I think, if you can take them, and if you can't, give it to one of your relatives. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll also have a tour, and when you go out on the tour, if you can do it, don't forget passing that Predzilla car by Nissan. Talk about extreme generosity for someone that had so much fun during the playoffs. They gave us a $100,000 car to auction off for all those proceeds to go to the foundation. So again, thank you all very much. Thank Appreciate you, Sean. It. It was a great presentation. We really, um, it means a lot. And you said something about seven years. Uh, I wasn't going to bring this up, but today is my daughter's seven year birthday. Yeah. And it, I had to bring it up because I was actually pregnant with her when I started this board. And um, I was just sitting here thinking of all the experiences as a family that we've had at the Titans, at the, at the arena here for the Predators, uh, cheering on the sounds. And it's just really, it's special. That's why um, you know we're here as a sports community because of the experience for families in our community. And it's been very special um, in a personal way for me. So I want to say happy birthday to my daughter. Um, and our next meeting is at uh, First Tennessee Park on September 21st. I believe we'll have a finance committee meeting uh, before that. And I'm sure we will let uh, the board know when that is. And um, don't forget to leave your binders. And if there is no other business, I would move to adjourn. Thank you. We're adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.